Okay, let's come back together. Everybody ready? Okay, the last quick point I wanted to make on that is don't confuse standards with standardizing. You can have high standards and get to the, meet that high standard in different ways. Okay. All right, so strategies, ideas for um, engaging students in different ways. And they're going to meet the need, all of those different needs that I just went through. I don't match them specifically to say I did this strategy for this person because I find when I put something in place it actually met a lot of different ones all at the same time. So um, I, I organize them in terms of the three principles under um, UDL. So we'll talk about engage, things I've done for engagement, things I've done for representation, things I've done for action expression, and then assessment. Um, I allow sunglasses and headphones in my class. I have students, and I give them the that option in the beginning. As long as you're participating, and I know you're not sleeping behind them, if the fluorescent lights, which I can turn off, most of the classrooms I teach in, I can turn off part of the classroom. Sometimes I can't. They're either on or off, and there's no optional lighting. So um, I can't always just have them down because a number of folks can't see what they're doing. So if the, the fluorescent lights really bother or the harsh glare from the screen or something, I've had students with that sensory processing issue that they do wear sunglasses in class. And some, if it's, if it's significant in their life, they have their own glasses that, that darken or something like that. But otherwise, I allow sunglasses. I allow headphones if they're working independently. Um, so if they are taking a touch, just the noise blocking headphones, not necessarily earbuds that could be playing the answers to the test on their phone or something, but um, uh, <laughs> so that they can block out all the noise. Because just people coughing and sneezing and blowing their noses and shifting in their chair and getting up and asking me questions and things like that are going to keep other people from, focus, from being able to focus. Uh, seating alternatives. Um, so there's lots of different things out there. Cafe tables in parts of your class. Some folks need to stand to learn. And then sit a little bit, then stand again. So if there's just somewhere where they can subtly go to stand up, um, that's a really great accommodation. Um, some other things are adjustable desks, you know, because we have all the money in the world to do this with. There's desks that just, you just stand up and you pull it with you. And then it just put you know, hydraulic and it just goes right back down, which is nice. Um, there's also a company called Viggy Kids, and I have it linked here. Um, for the electronic slides, but it's called V. It's spelled V I G G I Kids, and that's the name of the company right now. But the product is a widget, and it's a different seating device that's made all the way through adult sizes. And there's a classroom at Rochester Institute for Technology, RIT in Rochester, that has them right now, and they are um, doing a study on how it changes their learning in that classroom. And it's a plastic molded chair that rocks a little, so it absorbs your physical energy while you're sitting in it. So it's the same idea as people who sit on exercise balls, but it has different, it uses different muscles and motions, and um, it can be propped up tall to be a stool, it can be flipped over to be a desk space if you're sitting on the ground, and so it's a really adaptable piece of furniture. Um, so things like that. Uh, lighting alternatives, when I can, this is one of the classrooms where I teach in, so if I can turn off half the lights and put a desk lamp, I've done that too. Um, I left a desk lamp in the classroom once and it wasn't there the next time I went. So it's a little, you know, we have to think about those things too. If we're universally designing our classrooms, can every classroom have a cabinet? So that then I can put the stuff that I use in there and know I don't have to truck it back and forth. It just makes it easier for me to be universal um, and those types of things. So it's a campus-wide effort. Um, but just dealing with the harsh light, sometimes empty somebody's picture a lot faster than somebody else's. The other idea is, um, and it was interesting to hear Kim talk about um, uh, reading white print 
on a uh, black background or black print on a white background. That's what she needs for her. Um, other, there are studies that show for um, just visual processing, not necessarily with the vision loss, but for visual processing, reading black print on white paper is the most exhausting for our brains. But it's printed that way because it's the cheapest. So for folks who can read on a colored paper, providing them with colored paper or a sheet of acetate in different Remember from the old days with the overheads? Sometimes they're, maybe they're just today days for some folks. Um, but the, the sheet of acetate that comes in pink or yellow or green or blue and you lay it over the page, that you can actually read more and read longer. Um, if that works for you, then if you're just reading white and black. So. All right, um, another engagement, um, allow food, drink, and gum. I know they're not allowed in labs and other places where they're going to. Um, none of our pharmacy classes at Fisher are allowed to have food to drink in them, things like that. Um, allowing students to chew gum, as long as they're not being obnoxious with it, can really help relieve anxiety and help students process what they're listening to. Allow breaks. Should have a break every five minutes, every hour of instruction for people to actually get up off their bottoms. Um, blood pools in that blood response to gravity, it's like everything else, and when it's all in your bottom, it's not up here. So just getting up and making it circulate through every once in a while helps. Um, fidgets. This is actually my bucket of fidgets that I pass around every class. Um, I also have little um, mandalas. Do you know what mandalas are? The round designs, intricate designs, and I have little sheets of those and markers for folks to color while they listen. And I have done um, some um, data collection over the amount of time that folks can focus on and listen. And, they've, and uh, some students find the coloring distracting. Some find that it make no difference. And some have found that they have listened longer and remembered more if they were coloring while I was talking to them. So it's, it's different. Every brain likes different things. So there's a whole variety of things. And there's, there's prickly things. And there's soft things. And there's hacky sacks. And there's a balloon filled with rice um, and things like that. And yes, they look like toys, but they help a lot. And if you've been fiddling, if any of you have been fiddling with your jewelry or your pen or your pencil or the corner of your paper or anything, your brain probably likes to do something else while it's listening. And if you have been indulging that need, you will remember a little bit more or apply it a little bit better. So I don't mind. I have uh, colleagues who are distracted in their teaching because folks have stuff on their desk. So have them use it under their desk. Have it be a little bit more subtle. They, um, they sell rings with beads on them. They sell just having a rubber band on your wrist and moving your finger around the rubber band can help a lot. So, um, some other things. Oh, uh, continuing the online discussion after class. So I post just a link where um, on my Blackboard. Um, I don't know if everybody uses Blackboard, Chalk and Wire, Angel, lots of different online systems out there. We use Blackboard. So every day on Blackboard after class, I, wherever we left off with the discussion, I post it. And so folks can keep the discussion going. So that helps those who had a lot to say. And I, you know, they were, I made sure that the conversation got around to everybody. So there was folks who really, really wanted to say more about that and they didn't have time and they get to continue in electronic format. And if their response is to Screens long, I will read through it, but their peers don't necessarily have to, but they got to express what they needed to express to help them think through it. Um, I've also gotten phenomenal contributions on the online discussion after class from folks who wouldn't dare raise their hand during class. And when I have an opportunity to talk to them and say, that was really, really good thinking, the next I see their hands start to go up in class a little bit more. So they just had to realize that it was a safe space for their thoughts or they knew they had a good thought, but they also knew that they were going to need five minutes to really think it through. And by that time, we had moved on. So this provides processing time for a lot of folks. And I still get to hear from all of them. Um, flexible grouping, trying to find ways in your classroom for them to work with a partner or get in a small group or a large group, moving from large to small to partner to alone and back again a lot during class um, and having them choose. Um, talking it out strengthens those neurological pathways. You've heard it, you've read it, you've got it talked it out. That's three different ways that you've, that you've um, reinforced that, that collection of neurons. Um, the 10-2 theory, Paula Rutherford. This is my lesson plan. I don't know how well you can see it. It's a little bit small here. But I have 
this is what I'm going to talk about. This is one to two minutes they're going to process it. This is what I'm going to talk about. Then a shaded area, one to two minutes they're going to talk about. So as I've been talking, stopping and asking you to connect with the partner, that's your two minutes. For every 10 minutes of new information, your brain needs one to two minutes to process it. Whether you just sit there with it and think about it, whether you write it down, whether you draw a picture, whether you talk, turn to a neighbor and talk about it. And it will stay with you longer than if you just listen straight. So it seems like lost instructional time, but you're actually gaining a lot more minutes throughout your class period. Um, materials and text and video and audio format. Um, uh, PowerPoint has a video format, so as you talk through each slide, you can start the recording, and when you're done, you stop it, and then you link it. So then, if somebody's going back to it afterwards, they can just listen to what you said about each slide without having to go through the whole tape recording of the whole lesson. Um, post your electronic materials ahead of time. Have everything ready for the first day of class for folks. So if you know that folks need it in a certain format, if you, they need it in large print, don't do it by week, week by week because everybody else had the choice to read ahead. They bought the book at the beginning of class, and now they're waiting for you to post electronic chapters one at a time or having them um, put in a different format one at a time. They don't have that choice to read ahead. Um, so if everybody gets it, the whole book in the beginning of the semester, then everybody gets the whole book in the beginning of the semester. Um, blunk, black or chunk uh, materials and assignments. So if you know that you have a long-term assignment, think about giving some sub-due dates. And um, some folks won't need it, and they'll say, yeah, that's great, I'm still going to do it Thursday if it's due Friday. But other folks will need to know part three should be done by you know, this week in order for me to get you feedback, and then you do part four and things like that. So just kind of chunking it out for them and knowing how much time each chunk of the assignment. That's an executive functioning skill. If you don't have it internally, it helps to do it externally and talking it through at once. They're still in charge of getting those subparts to you during those due dates or getting the whole thing to you at the end of the semester by the due date, but kind of piecing it out helped them process so they could keep more water in their pitcher and use that water for the, actually the content that's going into the project than trying to figure out how much they have to be working on each week. Um, graphic organizers. Judy Wills calls them dendrite food. Brains love graphic organizers. Um, so anytime that you are presenting material and you put it into some format that shows the relationship, and there's a million of them on SmartArt, um, all the different pyramids and Venn diagrams and flow charts and timelines and things like that, if you present it that way and then also allow them to show it to you that way, so draw pictures on their tests or do a poster presentation instead of a final paper. That actually has some implications for um, uh, career preparation because you are something you're gonna to have to do at a conference is prepare a poster and visually present your work. So. All right. Um, I'm a little bit ahead here. Representing for auditory, auditory loops or communication access real-time translation. Uh, there's things called scribe pens. Has anybody seen a scribe pen? They might be talking about it this afternoon. Um, I have a couple students who have used those, so they take notes and the pen actually um, records the lecture, and then when they touch their notes again, the pen pays back what was said at that when they wrote that part down. It's really nice. Self-amplifiers, they come everything from a little PVC tube to a little plastic thing that's a little childish looking that's called the tubalu, but they also make one for adults that's called the whisper phone. It's kind of like Dr. Seuss whisper my phone. Um, but it has a headband and just a little piece, and you can whisper really softly to yourself, but it sounds like you're talking at full volume. For folks who need to process auditorily, to really hear them and say it, you know, if they're taking a test and thinking through it, you, they can't just be talking to themselves during a test, they're gonna disrupt other people, but if they have a self-amplifier, they can be almost, imperceptibly talking to themselves, but it sounds really loud, so that helps. Um, notability, where am I? Uh, notability is a note-taking app where you can do different things with it. It's on, uh, made for iP iPad and iPhone. That's a good thing to check out. I have folks that swear by that. I use in and out folders in my classroom. They're kind of like college cubbies. 
the cubbies from preschool where you can keep your extra clothes and, and the stuff that you need close by. So if there's materials that I hang out, uh, hand out and I say, make sure you bring that with me with you next time because we're going to talk about that a little bit more, I have a few that say, can I keep it in my folder? Because then they know it's going to be there for them when they get back. Or I'll put an extra copy of it in their folder so they can practice bringing it back. But if something should go wrong, they still have it and they're not left out of whatever it is that we're doing in class. Um, and posting anything online is like an electronic cubby. It's there. Wherever they go, they've got it. So that's really nice. Um, so this is something that might not work for, uh, as Kim mentioned, so not, might not work for everybody. But I color code my syllabus with stuff that I post online. So when I describe it in the syllabus, I put if, you know, assignment, their journal, weekly journals, is in a red box on the syllabus. And then on the actual course schedule where it's due, it's in red. And then on, posted on Blackboard, it's on red. It seems like a tiny thing. And, but it actually has helped folks match the description with. Some of us can do that very easily in your head, and it doesn't seem like a difficult skill, but if you don't have it, it can cause a lot of confusion and a lot of energy. Okay, okay so for that student that you were thinking of before, do you have an idea on that student who's shown that there might be a mismatch in the environment in, in your work? Um, is, are you thinking about something now that might make a difference, make a better match. Think about that for just a couple of seconds. I'm running out of time. Okay, I have a few things for um, action and expression. Um, allowing choice, allowing choice in how the assignments are completed. So I do allow them to hand things in in a paper format um, on PowerPoint slides, uh, in a Prezi, in a poster, however they want to do it. I've had students spend an inordinate amount of time, or what I think would take an inordinate amount of time, doing a poster when I did when I just a quick journal response or something like that. But they said they really they like it better. They work faster that way than if they were to just type it up. So I think it would be faster to type it up for me, but for them, it was much easier and engaging and made it something that they wanted to do. So, yeah, I have to haul posters back to my office to read through them, but that's okay. Um, Allowing choice in how the uh, whoops, and how the assignments are um, submitted. So I do allow posting through Blackboard, handing in hard copy, or emailing to me. And it did. I use my email inbox as my to-do list, and so I did have trouble at first because I'm trying to go through everything that I have to get done in a day, and there's 37 essays in my way. So I pull. I created a folder so I could pull them all over to the side. And old dog, new trick. It did take me a little bit of time to get used to the fact that I have a stack of papers on my desk to grade, and also a virtual stack of papers in my email folder to grade. But once I just got in the habit of going to both places, it's just as quick to, to grade things. And I am getting better responses from more students uh, more consistently just by allowing them to email stuff by me. It's, to, it's that choice, and it's available to everybody. Um, avoiding set switching, which means pretty much like if you have a long-term assignment due, um, try to keep it separated out from, if you have daily assignments and plus weekly assignments plus a long-term assignments going on all at the same time, it's difficult for students to go back and forth working on different ones. Um, so kind of um, scheduling when parts are due so that they don't have to switch back and forth as much. As much. All right, what's that last one? Allow the use of templates and graphic organizers for them to hand in their assignments. For some of the social things in class, um, uh, assigning roles for cooperative learning activities, set ground, ground rules. Um, I talk a lot about sharing the wealth. Okay, thanks, we're going to share the wealth now. Somebody else 
And so it's not, I need to cut you off now, you're done. You know, it's not something where they, they don't feel, I don't want to intimidate them from responding in the future, but they do need to share the wealth. And our, you know, the wealth is the time that we have to be together and talk together about stuff. Um, but I have to set those ground rules in the beginning of the semester. During discussion, you will hear me say things like, share the wealth. We're going to, okay, I need to stop you because you need to share the wealth. And that's because I just want to make sure I hear from everybody. And we'll always have that online discussion after class so you can keep going. Um, provide post-it notes for asking questions. I collect a pile of post-it notes every at the end of every class so they can get their questions in. Um, think pair share. It's hard to get left out of a group. Got that or out of a pair from um, Paula Rutherford. Just to have that um, bouncing back and forth. Um, I've had to talk to some students through some rating scales. Like, you know, that, um, you know, a, a one is you seem really engaged in class and really enthusiastic and really connected with your uh, peers to a five where you're really checked out and, you know, even, you know, grunting when somebody says something to you, you know, and kind of, I don't know if you're aware of it, but I'm seeing this. And so sometimes in class, I'm going to signal to you that you're, getting, you're approaching a three. And so you're going to want to check how you're coming across to other people and bring it back down to a two or a one. And just bringing that awareness to how they're coming off to other people has made a real difference. Um, and then anything that you use in class, there has to be a universal way to use it, whether it's a lab equipment, whether it's the smart board, um, whether it's what they write on, what they write with, so that everybody can access anything that you're doing. All right. Um, some things I do for assessment. Um, extended time on test, whether that's documented or not. Redos, retakes. I want to know what they have left my class learning, not what they did the first time. Um, visual rubrics with checklists. So sometimes my rubrics are in chart form and sometimes I draw it into a pie graph. So did you see line three on the rubric is, is that green section in the pie? That's pretty big. That's going to take most of your time and it's going to be the heaviest weighted part of the assignment. So that helps. Um, anything that has to do with their executive functions is worth less than 10% of their grade. So um, formats so that they can show me their knowledge and their skills and still get 90% in the class, even if things are late, even if things are coming a little sloppy. I want to know their knowledge and skills and then give them supports for executive functions. Adapted test, highlighting things they should work on first. Helps for folks. Um, Pre-questions. Handing folks cards. This is a question I'm going to ask in class today if you want to write down a few things that will help you respond because I know you'll have a good answer to this and I want your peers to hear what you have to say. I think it gives them a little thing to practice with first. All right. So where do you start? One little change will go a long way and you can do one thing in um, one class this semester and then do it in all of your classes next semester and then add a second thing and so on. So over 20 years of teaching, I'm doing dozens and dozens of things in my class all the time, but I didn't start out that way. It really has stretched over the years. All right. So then I hear a lot. Uh, so this is college, though. Just because we can give those accommodations, should we? Yep. I really believe that you should. And here's why. Um, if success means being able to do it. It doesn't mean being able to do it just like everybody else. It doesn't mean being able to do it perfect the first time. And it doesn't mean being able to do it really fast. Maybe if you're an EMT. But there are very few things in my job today that I have to do really fast, perfect the first time, or exactly like everybody else. I don't do anything standardized. Even my accreditation reports are different from the next schools. So there are things that have to meet standards, but they don't have to be perfectly standardized. So, um, uh, I'm going to thank my husband for this. He, um, he is... Uh, uh, designs adaptive um, uh, and assistive technology, and does, he's a product designer and inventor, so he comes up with a lot of things. So he's constantly, I'll talk something out and I'll say, I want to, I want to talk about this, and he'll be drawing what I'm talking, what I'm saying at the same time. So this was what, when I was talking this out to him, this is what he drew. So you have everybody with lots of different abilities. It's not showing up really well, but there's, a, there's this blue circle with lines through it, like a pie. So all of these different, um, abilities that people have. And what we expect from people in, in school, at least the way it's traditionally set up, is it's going to overlap some of those abilities. 
So some of the things that people can do, they're going to be doing really well in school. There will be a match to some of them, but not to all of them. There's not a complete overlap in these circles. And so what we're finding in careers is we have people, careers that entail a college education, we have people that fit just in that overlap. That's how diverse our, our career fields are right now, is those people who were able to do school well, that had the abilities that match the school. But we want all of these other people with all of these other abilities in career fields too. We need diverse people in career fields to do different things. The 21st century is gonna have us needing skills that we don't even know exist yet, and we're not bringing in. So if we're excluding people from school, or making college an experience that's not equitable, and people are not, uh, we're not retaining folks, or they're not going out into their chosen career, ch chosen career fields, then we're excluding people who we really need them in 21st century jobs. Okay, and then, um, and so, oh, this is what um, the um, circles was kind of pulling out. What is essential for people to know in your career? What is really important for them to know? And what's nice to know? If having it done really fast is nice to know, stop requiring it. If having it with the right heading on the paper is just something nice for you, it's not really important or essential, get rid of it. Just really focus on what is essential and what is important and support those things. So then you'll get to that diverse a group of people going into the field. And here are some quotes, that some of my favorite quotes, just to close up. Um, this is my son Sam Rapp and his high school graduation ground. So I told you I was going to go back to the dog in that little cartoon. I showed him that cartoon once, and he um, has gone through school getting supports for lots of different learning disabilities and sensory integration disorder, executive processing disorder. And... Um, he said, that's it. You have to just let me be the best dog I can be. I am not an elephant. I am not a fish. I am not a penguin. Just let me be the best dog I can be. I am loyal. I am cute. I can dig like nobody's business. This kid is tenacious, but he's never going to climb a tree. So, um, Abraham Lincoln said, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew, and we, we must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. Kind of applies to lots of different things. And then this is my friend Lucio Barrino, my dear colleague, who thinks and acts and performs and teaches out of the box all the time, and her quote is, we need to get out of our own way. We really kind of expect things a lot of time that just shoot us in the foot. So let's get out of our own way. So there's lots of benefits to inclusion, and I think they really apply to the college setting as well. Everybody is going to um, uh, achieve, and they're going to see around themselves that there's not just one way to solve a problem. We're going to model for people that there's lots of problem solvings, and we're going to pay forward that social model of disability if our, if our college classes are inclusive. I've gone over time. I apologize. I close up. There's some references there for some of the things that I know. So, it's actually okay to do time for questions because once you get things set up. Oh, great. Okay, good. Good. All right. Good. I wanted to make sure to get to those. So. Um, so we have an academic recovery program that we put students in who struggled the first semester or second, and we give them extra support. And I'm thinking of when I talk to these students, they're often... Um, they have difficulty with their goals. They don't seem as motivated. They have problems with time management. And we've been working with that by giving them workshops, et cetera. And I'm thinking when you went back to the executive functioning, maybe we're approaching it wrong. I mean, people walk away saying, you know, he's just not engaged or she's just lazy or they're not motivated. And I'm wondering if they are, some of the students are having these executive functioning yeah. and we're missing how we're reaching them. And so what kind of supports could we be including in our plan to help them? Absolutely. I, would, I think you would be surprised at how many folks are impacted by executive functioning difficulties. And they are part of your prefrontal cortex. They develop through your 20s. And there's some evidence to show that there are folks in their early 30s who are still developing new executive functioning abilities. So we take 18 to 22-year-old tri typical traditional um, college students and they still have adolescent executive functionings. They are not fully formed yet. So it's a key time to provide them with strategies and to build on them. And while they're still developing, some folks are only going to be so strong that really it is how you're hardwired. 
And so there's some things, I have an adult son who has come up with lots of different strategies and his executive functionings have developed. He will still, um, he still only follows two step directions. If you add a third step, he cannot process all three correctly, accurately. So he knows he, if they're going to be more than three steps, he has to write them down or he has to do one at a time or something like that. And that's always gonna be external to him, not internal, but as long as he is allowed that external support, he can be as successful as anybody else. So when he had his first part-time job, he had to make sure to say to his boss, when you say take out the trash and clean up that aisle and do that over there, I can remember two of those. So, you know, write down, a, write down 20 things you want me to do and hand it to you, and I'll, you know, and I'll do them all without reminders, but it has to be in writing, not just auditory. So knowing that about yourself is really important. And the other, and just knowing how executive functions work and that it is, it's, they're not tied to motivation or laziness is important for them and I think their self-esteem and self-efficacy to know that. <clears throat> this is kind of a fringe question, but I always wonder about olfactory supports in universal design because smell and memory mm -hmm. are tied so closely. Yes. And I you know I know that's a difficult one, but do you have any examples in that um, area? I haven't. I've had folks who've had um, really extreme reactions to certain sounds, like gum chewing, and in the same class, a student who has to chew gum for anxiety. So those discrepant needs are always really difficult. Someone who loves the bright lights, and then somebody who doesn't and needs the softer lighting, and then can they know, does that mean they can never work together in a small group? Because I have them on opposite ends. So. I have done things, at, at this point it's proximity, those are the things that have worked so far. I haven't had anybody with olfactory, but the, you know, the idea is understanding that it works that way. And if they need to um, be holding something that smells pleasant to them versus something else they can smell in the classroom. I've had people tell me, I can smell everybody in here. I'm really glad I don't, you know. Okay. So, um, for them, that's, that's something they're not filtering out. So a way for them to filter it. And, you know, that proximity, larger personal space, understanding when they have to get up and leave. So sometimes it's just allowing for and not actually doing to it can help. But, yeah, I'm going to think about that because that's good problem solving to go to. I haven't had that experience myself, but, yes, that can be an issue. Could you say, uh, when you're planning your course, are you thinking purposefully about building in resiliency for students? Because I think, um, I mean, I guess your comment about stress made me think about that. Because I think that um, it's, a, it's a term that's being talked about, of course. But just to be, to be able to hang in there and struggle with what you have to do and just resiliency, I guess. They're building yeah. resilience, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do think, I, I try to strike that balance between, you know, I want them to support and feel encouraged to know it's a non-threatening place without pampering. You know, and just because we are going to come up w with situations that are hard and challenges we have to meet and to, you know, if, if you get... If you provide for them so much that they get to a challenge and they say, oh, I can't do that, I need a support, then you're not helping either. So what it really comes down to is building a community where they, where they know that it's okay to say this is hard and to agree, yes, it's hard and we're going to keep at it. Not, we're, okay, good, then we'll, we'll avoid that then. But no, we're, then we're going to keep, we're going to try, we're going to try something different, but we're going to keep at it and we're going to keep climbing and we're going to, and you might not climb as fast, this is what I talk to students a lot about, too, is they get very nervous when they say, so-and-so is almost done with her project. Yep, you're not so-and-so. So it is going to take you longer to, to go through the steps of this project. And if you need a little bit extra time, that's fine, as long as you are doing each part and you're getting your feedback and you're working on it. And so trying to, you know, knowing you're not going to compare them, knowing you've taken that bell curve and set it aside, and, and you know, it's a descriptor, not a prescriptor. It doesn't mean just because there's an A student, there has to be an F student on the opposite end. You can keep pushing them toward where they're, they're going to be. Is that helping a little bit? It's a lot in the, crea the community you create. In a, sort of, in, a, in a sort of a general sense, I, I notice that if students don't do well in a class or in a 
path, then they're asked to assess that, but which is good. But then they're also saying, well, maybe you ought to change your major. This is not good. You're not, you know, you can't do that. And, and there's this field now of data analytics where they're tracking students and looking and trying to be prescriptive, proscriptive, prescriptive about saying, well, you know, maybe you're making the wrong choice. You shouldn't be in this. You should be in this. And, and so that's good too, except that the balance of struggle and obstacles and barriers gives you some strength if you have the supports to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a couple of different things there, and and the, that counseling conversation that maybe this isn't the field for you has its time and its place. Don't do it too soon. I've seen it happen with um, folks with autism who have gotten into a program, a teacher education program, and, and been told, well, teaching's not for you. People with autism aren't teachers. We don't know that yet. I know folks with autism who are teachers. And... Just because you haven't seen it and you can't imagine how it's going to play out doesn't mean that you shouldn't figure that out. So, but then at the same time, once you know you've provided those supports, that playing field has been level and it's not a skill set that matches, then is the time for that conversation. You love kids, you love being in the school environment. Let's think of all the things associated with teacher education that might match your skill set. Not say education's not for you, but maybe being a classroom teacher's not. But there's lots of different things in, in the medical field as well. Over here. I just wonder if, if any of you have noticed, now that we have a, a new mandate as far as how many hours, credit hours students can take and there's a cap, if you get a student that has all, all of a sudden decided that they're not able to continue at that level, have you found that there's added um, pressure on the students knowing that they have that strict cap with their credits to what graduate? You, so many that they can take. Yeah, we, I maximum? mean, SUNY right now has a mandate on how many credits that you can take in order to get your bachelor's degree. Well, and I think it's actually with your associate's degree, too. And I think as a student, well, overall, not oh, yeah, overall, but say you're halfway through your program and all of a sudden you're realizing that maybe that's not the program for you. And then there, there's that added stressor of knowing that you may have to go up against somebody and, and explain to them why you're going above that credit, that credit cap that's there. I just wondered if anybody else had any insight as to how that affects their students. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. We're not in, we're not dealing with that where we are. Um, I would say, yeah, it is an added stressor, but it's an added stressor for everybody. So if we are if we are making sure that it's equitable equitable across, so if a student does get accommodations and they have to figure out so long which ones they are that work for them, they finally get them in place. Then they realize, okay, they're in place, and I did have the opportunity to do well, but chose not to. Now I decided, now that I can access everything and do it, I decided this isn't the field for me, and I'm going to switch over. Then they have that ad, and they might go over that credit limit. So the faster we get everything in place in the beginning and from the get-go, you know, so that they can be at the same starting line as everybody else, then it's an equitable stressor for everybody. So, again, it's not removing that stressor just because they get accommodations, but making sure that their starting line isn't here where everybody else has got to be back here. Does that start to help? <laughs> yeah. I feel bad because this is not a question, Megan. So let me just say that I don't... I'm not in program review, but I don't believe that SUNY has a program a credit cap on how many credits you can take. What SUNY has is a cap on how many credits can be required. So before that happened, there were, we had ed programs with 150 credits that were required because of the accrediting body, NK. My students in the music program, my program only requires 122 credits, but I can assure you most of my students take 130 or 140 because they want to take more music. So I think the cap is on what the school can require, not how many credits the student can take. Do you 
Still, your point is well taken. what they think. Sorry. I have a big mouth, so I thought it's actually not for the room. It's for ESC TV. <laughs> we are at time. <laughs> and I'm sure that people are interested in having someone. So thank you very much, um, thank you. Whitney. I think